Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start. This is the last lecture of our quantum transfer course. And we will talk about dissipation, decoherence, and dephasing. For most of the course, we have idealized quantum systems that we have considered. We've been talking about electron waves, which propagate through nanostructure, like quantum waves, with the same energy, keeping their quantum phase. We've been talking about qubits, ideal quantum systems, uh, now, in the concluding lecture, I would like to address processes which spoil this ideal behavior, which kind of uh, return the physical situation to a classical world. Dissipation is related to energy loss, energy exchange between electrons or dissipation in qubit. Uh, decoherence, which is, well, almost the same as devising, characterizes the loss of quantum phase. It's also different processes. And first we just look at these two processes uh, uh, from the point of view of classical physics to understand better what do we discuss. Then we look at general quantum description and uh, decoherence and uh, anticipation um, come back from the environment. You dissipate energy into environment, you are influenced by environment, and uh, your quantum phase is changing. Then we look at uh, qubits and electrons separately. And indeed, there are also different systems. Uh, qubit is a uh, two level system, electron, uh, we are talking about the wave. All uh, right. It would be interesting topic to understand how Nyquist noise, um, electric noise, affects and uh, sometimes defines the coherence. And uh, right. Uh, it is. It comes rather seldom in this course. I will also talk about experiments, um, important experiments on dephasing and relaxation for electron waves. This is the outline. And... Um, Let me start with classical mechanics. Let me talk first about friction and dissipation. If we are in ideal world, in ideal world of Newton mechanics, it's governed by energy conservation. Also, the time reversibility of the equations of classical mechanics, which means that any process which goes in one direction can be reverted and can go to other direction. But well, it's not what we see in real world and the most uh, uh, pronounced manifestation uh, of non-ideality is friction. Uh, eventually there's nothing um, 
mysterious in the friction. And in fact, if you look at microscopic uh, origin of the friction, it is still the same classical mechanics. But uh, we are talking about uh, interaction of a single degree of freedom, for instance, an oscillator, pendulum, could be mechanical pendulum, uh, with all other degrees of freedom, for instance, pendulum uh, collides with the uh, molecules uh, of the gas. So it's still, uh, it's still um, classical mechanics, but we look at single degree of freedom in uh, an environment consisting of many other degrees. Good, so what is that about? What is the manifestation? If you look at oscillator with no friction, it oscillates. So the oscillations would persist uh, for infinite time. With friction, we have this um, green line. So after some time, characteristic time, the energy of the oscillator will be dissipated to uh, to the environment. Friction, dissipation. Let me talk about different phenomena, which is also pretty classical but concerns phase and coherence of oscillations. It's not yet quantum phase, it's not yet quantum coherence, uh, but let us, uh, let us see what, what, we, what we have. Uh, let us talk about the same oscillator, but with frequencies that fluctuates, um, Time. The scale of these fluctuations is much smaller than the main frequency. However, one has to recognize that the effect of this fluctuating frequency accumulates with time. Uh, to illustrate it, let us look at this figure. I hope my program would not crash if I zoom. Yeah, this figure here do see two oscillations with a little bit different frequencies. And you see that in the beginning, frequencies, uh, the curves uh, go close to each other, but the difference uh, of frequencies uh, goes to phase, accumulates, and after some time you see that the phases of these two oscillations are different. Well, uh, completely different. Good. Uh, so, why is it so? Because, uh, because uh, the phase of the oscillation is the integral of frequency over time. Uh, if I will compute the variance, oh, that's not what I wanted. If I compute uh, the variance of frequency over a time interval, sorry, the variance of uh, phase accumulated over time interval, this variance will be proportional to time. Right? This is accumulation effect, and that means that whatever small uh, fluctuations, sooner or later, they will uh, lead to big frequency change.
Good. So let us quantify it a bit. Uh, let us, for instance, consider a correlator of um, oscillator positions uh, over some time. And we assume that oscillations eventually uh, are of the same magnitude. The only thing that changes is the phase. Right. X is, uh, for instance, cosine of this phase, or sine doesn't matter. So this is reduced to correlator of two exponents of the phase. I can rewrite it as an exponent of, uh, look what I found here. This is variance of phase difference. Good, we understand that it's proportional to time. So the total integral would go like, uh, like, uh, yeah, it says Gaussian function. It's not exponent, but anyway, it goes to zero with the uh, increasing time. That happens. The phase coherence is lost at some characteristic time. So, why? So let me arrange this formula like this. Good. So already in classical physics, we have two distinct phenomena, dissipation and decoherence, dephasing. Right. Uh, to illustrate how complex this phenomena can be, let me consider a little bit different situation. Let me consider money classical oscillators. And now let us, let me assume that these oscillators, each of these oscillator uh, does have fluctuating frequency. But the frequencies of these um, oscillators differ a little bit from each other, right? That's what I wrote here. So frequencies of individual oscillator are in certain interval and the value of this interval uh, is uh, small, much smaller than uh, the main frequency. Uh, however, if one looks at the total signal, which comes from many almost coherent oscillators, this signal will eventually go to zero. Why? Because the phases of different oscillators uh, will become randomized because of different frequencies. That's um, what I wanted to illustrate with this figure. So we now have plenty of oscillators. Uh, how much is plenty? Five. Five oscillators with different frequency and that is slightly different frequencies. That's how they evolve. And if you sum up their signal, what would you get? You would get something like um, Yeah, here they come all together. Here they come to deviate. So the, 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 the uh, turtle signal will go to zero pretty soon. Again, at some typical time, which one can uh, call the uh, coherence time. And uh, which is uh, well, uh, just inverse of this frequency variation. 
Good, so it is called apparent decay. Again, the under, it, even under assumption that each oscillator is coherent by itself. If you look at many, we will see apparent decay of oscillations. Um, uh, there will be no coherent signal after some time. Fine. That was classical physics. Any questions? I don't see anything um, in the chart. So I hope it's okay. Let us see. How about quantum mechanics? We still about uh, we are still uh, following the course of quantum transport and uh, what does it mean in quantum mechanics dissipation is always related to transitions between quantum states well quantum states typically have different energies and uh, the energy change amounts to a transition. Okay. This uh, quantum states can be discrete, as in case of qubits, or it can be continuous for electrons uh, propagating on a structure. Uh, the spectrum of possible quantum states is continuous. Anyway, dissipation is transition right when we talk about decoherence or again it's somewhat the same as the phasing in quantum transport usually we have very certain phase in made in, in mind that of a quantum wave function right and uh, the phase change related to the coherence can be observed between discrete states, for instance, the qubits at different energies. This is seen as a nuisance for qubit operation. You would like to keep uh, the qubit in resonance. You would like to see rabbi oscillations. Uh, when it goes uh, between the levels, well, these oscillations are damped by the coherence. Or it can be a phase change between interference electron waves at the same energy. So if you're in a usual quantum transport setup, we are looking at electron waves in a narrow energy window, very close to Fermi surface. So all interference happens there. And uh, the coherence the phase in, for instance, will uh, destroy Arona von effect. Remember, we've been uh, talking shortly about the coherence, the phasing, when we talk, for instance, about um, uh, universal conductance fluctuations. Um, but, well, today we will try to understand a little bit more about mechanisms of this phenomenon. Right, that's how dissipation coherence is seen in quantum transport. I have kind of an inequality here. What does it mean? 
I compare time required for dissipation and time required for the phasing. And I state that uh, the phasing time is always shorter than the dissipation time. That sounds like a very dogmatic statement because we have seen that the phasing and dissipation are kind of different processes. Nevertheless, this general relation is perfectly valid. Um, can somebody perhaps explain why it is valid? Can somebody um, put a hypothesis about this? Does it have something to do with many oscillators? Uh, not really. Um, but one, one, one can look at concrete examples, the kind of compute these times for concrete systems. But uh, let me uh, try to uh, egg you in general. Dissipation is a transition. So if you go from uh, once you go from one state and uh, to, to another state. And in this case, since you go to other states, the space is lost anyhow. There is a transition. Uh, but there are ways, and one can kind of see analogies in quantum physics, there are ways to lose the phase without losing energy, staying at the same quantum state. Uh, one can see analogy in, uh, in these uh, clocks with fluctuating frequency, they would keep the same magnitude of oscillation. So formally there's no dissipation, but uh, the phase is forgotten over, over some time. So it means just uh, this dissipation will always climb the phase, but there are possibilities to spoil the system, to quench, its phase coherence without transitions, without dissipations. That's what I meant by this inequality. Uh, right, so let us see. Uh, let us look at some general models which one can implement for uh, dissipation, decoherence, dephasing. I don't want in the beginning to specify anything, just to understand it a uh, little bit more mathematical fashion. Uh, basically repeating the same. Dissipation is related to transitions. Decoherence can proceed without transitions. Uh, right. First of all, we need to recall that interaction, uh, that dissipation decoherence both come, with inter uh, both come from the interaction 
is extra degrees of freedom. Um, okay, so let's let's make a Hamiltonian of the quantum system. There are some states labeled by M. And uh, let us have some environment. So there's plenty of states labeled is K. Good, then uh, what, uh, uh, then we need to arrange interaction between the system. So we'll, there will be terms in the Hamiltonian, which couple uh, degrees of freedom labeled by K and degrees of freedom labeled by N, right terms matrix elements in the Hamiltonian and they can be diagonal or non-diagonal. So uh, diagonal or non-diagonal with respect to the system variables with respect to N. And these matrix elements would cause transitions, well, basically between the states N and n prime accompanied some change in the environment. Uh, these elements would correspond to some transitions in the environment, and uh, they won't change the, 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 the state. So we can find here in this in this uh, scheme elements responsible for decoherence and elements responsible for dissipation uh, right let's uh, make uh, our model a bit more concrete let us consider a qubit with two states plus monies. And let us uh, recall the uh, previous lecture when we talk about environments, electromagnetic environment in particular, and we present it as a set of bosons, which is kept, for instance, at certain temperature. Good, so let us see what we uh, what we have for our qubit. So here I have diagonal elements for state plus state minus. Uh, here, just just split in between the two states of the qubit. Okay, and uh, this splitting could eventually fluctuate like frequency of oscillators in classical mechanics can fluctuate. All right, this is uh, fluctuate, uh, fluctuating part of the energy and frequency. And uh, since it comes from the environment, one can see it as a field operator or bosons, one can see it as a linear combination of bosons. Uh, good, there are also non-diagonal um, uh, non elements responsible for dissipation. And uh, I just want to save a bit of uh, fields. It could be very different fields, which is coupled to, to uh, non-diagonal elements, but I will use the same. I would just say that the same fluctuating energy also affects non-diagonal elements. It cannot be the same coefficients, there will be some dimensionless coefficient A. Uh, right, we have fluctuating energy and uh, it is contributed by many modes. There's a continuous spectrum of uh, the modes, and that leads to a continuous spectrum of 
the fluctuations. Right, well, that's how it is defined. And uh, right, what I uh, write here, it's a temperature affects this noise, this um, uh, the spectrum of this noise. It affects it in certain, uh, in very certain manner. As uh, temperature comes as this uh, as this factor, right, which depends on temperature and on frequency, and uh, the coefficient we can write as a uh, quantum noise noise at zero temperature. Right, so let us see what happens to the qubit. First of all, uh, let me look at the dissipation. We have two states of the qubit. We have a Hamiltonian which couples non diagonal modes, and we can. Uh, Utilize uh, Amy Golden rule. What is the initial state, for instance, a excited state of the qubits, and it goes to a uh, lower energy state, emitting one boson into the environment. Uh, depending on the environment, it can be a light, electromagnetic, quantum, a photon, a phonon. Um, Whatever. In at any case, it's a bosom. Let us see how do we apply the golden rule. There's always delta function in this golden rule, which uh, uh, expresses energy conservation of the process. Energy of the bosom emitted uh, must be just level splitting. Good. That we can express in terms of uh, the noise, in terms of the noise spectrum. And because of this relation, dissipation is defined by noise at very certain frequency, frequency corresponding to the splitting. Good, that is at zero temperature, when it only goes from excited state to the ground state, right? At finite temperature, we can also have inverse processes. So we are in the ground state, and there is a boson coming. Oops, and the state is excited. Absorption of the bosons. Uh, all right, uh, to account for this, we need to take um, boson distribution just how many bosons are there at this particular frequencies for absorption, for emission. And uh, this is nothing but boson distribution uh, function corresponding to this particular energy. Good, so at final temperature, there are rates in both directions. Uh, the ratio of these rates does not depend on this coefficients. It depends only on energy and temperature by virtue of thermal equilibrium. Good, that was about dissipation. Now let us um, talk about decoherence. There are many things to tell at the slide, but in fact they are all uh, 
a simple and uh, kind of uh, intuitive. We just need to energize uh, our intuition. Uh, first of all, let me know that the qubit is void if it's not manipulated. So there must be some control signal to this qubit. This signal can be just uh, this um, change of frequencies or some parameter which would change uh, this frequency. So there is some control channel. But if you open up a control channel, you inevitably have some noise in this control channel. So um, let us uh, kind of follow the ground. Let us assume most typical noise which uh, one can have. Let us assume white noise in the control channel. What does it mean? That the um, uh, fluctuation of the signal uh, is correlated only at very short time distance. Well, in this case, it can be written as delta function and some coefficient in front, which is eventually noise power at zero frequency, but it doesn't depend on frequency. Now, let me do some uh, algebra. I have already mentioned that uh, the effect of fluctuating frequency accumulates. Let me make this uh, quantitative. So, let me look at phase difference accumulated during time interval t. Well, this is the integral over fluctuating phase or energy, doesn't matter. We are talking about quantum size. Right, so if I average this, I will obtain this expression, something which is proportional to the noise intensity and time. Uh, right. There is a simple calculation which uh, I am um, from which it it follows or it's up to you. Uh, do you want me to present this calculation? Oh, well, perhaps it's evident for you. Uh, do you want me to present a calculation which uh, connect these two expressions? You might have gotten some other course. I don't know. Okay, yes, please direct your request. So let me just, um, or perhaps I can just uh, add a page. Uh, right, so frequency change. Integral from zero to T. Uh, let me skip the coefficient in front just to get the speed of writing. Good, uh, then what is delta phi squared? Each delta phi is an integral, so we have double integral. Yeah, and what we have here the product of two signals uh, good sir so now it's time to average
Uh, right, but uh, for white noise, let me put it in a separate color. It is delta function here. All right, so we integrate over delta function. What we get after first integration, for instance, integration over T double prime. Well, this is what we get. So it's eventually S times T. All right. Everybody got it? Uh, right, there's, there's yes, yes answer. Very good. So let me uh, come back. Right, so this uh, defines phase fluctuations. And uh, the fluctuation becomes of the order of one at some typical time. What time is it? Oh, well, uh, you, you just get it from this relation. The time is proportional to, um, sorry, inverse time, the decoherence rate is proportional to the noise intensity. Uh, right, uh, let me, before we go to break, let me uh, tell you a bit uh, a side story, which will become uh, useful uh, later in the lecture and well, has some uh, general value. Um, We associate this decoherence with a low frequencies. For white noise, it doesn't matter how low is the frequency because uh, because um, because um, uh, white noise spectrum doesn't depend on frequency. It can become uh, important if uh, the, uh, my, uh, the noise is colored, if we talk about uh, colored environment. In this case, a strange trick to determine the frequency of environmental modes which are responsible for decoherence. Namely, these frequencies are of the order of uh, inverse decoherence time by itself. But decoherence time in its own turn is determined by noise at these frequencies. That's why we come to this, uh, one can say, a self-consistency equation, which is uh, valid for, uh, which is relevant for uh, colored noise. What do I have here? I have the coherence rate, and I have noise, which depends on frequency. And I have to take this noise at frequencies of the order of tau f. So it's not expression for one over tau f. This is an equation to solve. Uh, let us look at some examples. What we have to step to the break. 
Okay, let's have a break. I promised long breaks, so let's uh, let us uh, stop for fifteen minutes. Sir, so, I'm here again. Let us implement uh, the trick we have uh, uh, learned uh, in, the, in the previous transparency. Decoherence uh, rate right, is, um, I mean, uh, from uh, frequencies of the rotor of decoherence rate uh, itself. So there are some uh, self consistent equation one has to solve for for um, uh, colored noise. Let us uh, see it as classification of environments. How we classify the environments uh, by the noise which is produced, so noise would be proportional to temperature since we are talking about low frequencies. Uh, it is also always proportional to temperature as far as um, uh, frequency is uh, smaller than the temperature in uh, quantum units. Okay, but uh, the frequency dependence uh, will be will be power law, and this uh, power law exponent s would uh, be used to classify the environments. First, subomic regime, and in this regime, s is smaller than zero, so eventually noise uh, increases at low frequency. Right. If we um, solve the resulting equation, that's what we get for one over tau phi. Uh, in a certain exponent, and this exponent is uh, smaller than one. What does it mean? It means that uh, the coherence rate as compared to temperature becomes very big. And uh, well, our approximation of, uh, of uh, weak decoherence doesn't work anymore. And this is dangerous, it's a dangerous situation. It means that um, the interaction with the environment completely suppressed quantum nature of the qubit. Good, that's one class of the environments. Subomic so ohmic environments, for these environments, S is just zero, white noise. We have discussed white noise, white noise. It gives one over tau f proportional to a temperature with hopefully some small coefficient, which guarantees that um, uh, the coherence, uh, the modes, um, which contribute to the coherence are still classical. There are two regimes and higher. Uh, S further a super ohmic regime, and in this we have, in this case, we have um, we have uh, decoherence rate proportional to power temperature, which is bigger than one, and uh, this is fine uh, because there is no danger at small temperature, small energies in this case. Our super ohmic B, this is a regime where noise increases with frequency very fast, say it could be like uh, parabolic. And in this case, if we try to solve a simple equation, we just get zero uh, decoherence on the answer that cannot be true because there are still fluctuations even for this type of noise but this 
fluctuations, interestingly, do not accumulate. So there will be some um, the signals, the correlator would not go to zero. The coherence won't be completed, uh, won't be complete after, uh, even after very long time interval. Good. So that was uh, classification of environments with respect to decoherence they produce. Is there something? Yeah. Um, let me go on. Let me. Shortly mention what happens in this subomic regime, where at small t we have uh, too much of uh, decoherence. Uh, I kind of discuss the situation more detail in my course of advanced quantum mechanics. Um, uh, what happens here instead of a qubit, instead of coherent quantum states, uh, we will have something like classical memory cell. So the qubit can still be in two states, but you cannot arrange coherence between them. You cannot make the superposition of two states. Um, and uh, there will be also no transitions between two states. So it would be, would be what is called qubit localization. So, uh, quantum mechanics de delocalizes qubits between qubit between two states. Uh, interaction with the subomic environment localizes it. Localizes it. Uh, right. So now let's uh, talk about the electrons. Um, we will talk about. Um, dissipation and decoherence and first i would like to address not the mechanisms of this effect but just manifestations one can see the effect of dissipation let us take um, the double berry system the system we have exploited for quite a while in many lectures so there is a node between two leads. Uh, and uh, let us first understand what would be uh, distribution of electrons over energy in this node. If there is no dissipation. So there are some uh, Dwell time in this in the nanostructure and uh, yeah, it's eventually this time. And in this case, we assume that it's short, that dissipation uh, doesn't happen when electron uh, is traversing the nanostructure. Uh, fine. In this case, we have electrons inside which come from the left with a chemical left chemical potential which come from the right with the right chemical potential so the um, if voltage is uh, larger than temperature the resulting uh, distribution has a typical uh, feature of two steps corresponding to two different potentials Right, uh, so let me consider different opposite situation when dwell, ti dwell time is, uh, is um, alone than dissipation time. In this case, electrons inside the structure have time to exchange energy, so let us first Assume that they exchange energy, no energy goes out. 
Then uh, what will happen, um, there will be distribution inside corresponding to some temperature. Temperature um, would be of the order of uh, voltage. So instead of this distribution, there will be some smooth distribution corresponding to uh, temperature. Uh, well, and what will happen when uh, we provide uh, cooling to the system, when we provide dissipation from the nanostructure to exterior, all right, that uh, cooling would set this distribution to zero temperature. So there will be some, as a result of dissipation, we will see uh, energy distribution with a single step sufficiently uh, thin because uh, the temperature is uh, in the node is sufficiently low. Uh, very good. I have a question for you. Uh, we have discussed this already. We have already discussed this, and which lecture was that? Who remembers? Over terror in which context uh, we discuss this? Anybody? We did it in um, lecture number three, when we have started with double barrier, uh, have considered uh, interference, many channels, how Ohm's law has been restored, and we understood the importance of balance equations of conservation modes in quantum transport and eventually we have illustrated it with these uh, three examples so that was lecture number three Um, good, uh, let us uh, see how we can proceed further. Let me, if you look at the mis uh, manifestation of dissipation, let us look at um, manifestation of dephasing. Again, we've been talking about this shortly. If there's finite the phasing, the uh, phase coherence is pre preserved at some typical lens. How can I get it? I assume diffusive transport of electrons. I have diffusion coefficient, and that's uh, how that's a, a space scale at which electrons can propagate before their phase is lost. Um, at this lens, they keep coherence. So if we turn back to uh, Aron of Baum effect, all uh, right, as you remember, it comes about interference of different trajectories. And for interference, it's of course important that the phase um, is preserved, uh, um, uh, is, is preserved uh, along the trajectory. Uh, good, there was a question, what does the letter stand for? This stands for diffusion, uh, right? So if you remember, the, we discussed it several times, diffusion equation.
which uh, defines random uh, electron trajectories. D is diffusion coefficient. And uh, simultaneously, it uh, kind of um, gives uh, the length, uh, the spread of um, trajectory uh, over a certain time. Is it clear? Uh, right. So the, the phase in the coherence should kill a runoff bomb effect because interference pattern is gone. Um, the phase is forgotten during the motion. It means that a runoff bomb effect can only be observed if, for instance, the size of this loop is smaller than the coherent band. Well, all right, weak localization. Uh, that we also uh, looked upon. Uh, weak localization can be eventually observed in very long samples. Uh, right, because uh, a long sample can be Uh, seen as um, a sequence of coherent conductors. Uh, each conductor has quantum correction of the order of the Q. So we, for a given coherence length, we have uh, L divided by L5 coherent conductors in the sample of lens L. And uh, okay, it uh, this interference pattern also sup is suppressed by uh, magnetic field. So, as we discuss, if we look at um, the magnetic conductance, conductance versus magnetic field, uh, it has a dip, and this dip is spread over magnetic fields. Uh, then the magnetic lens is of the order of uh, decoherent. As we will see, there's also this is also a way to measure. Decoherence time or decoherence lens. One would just uh, measure the conductance versus magnetic field. Looking at, well, uh, this is small change, small contribution, and uh, figure out what is the decoherence time. Good. Manifestations. I think we can go. Other and I will talk rather shortly about the mechanisms of dissipation. First of all, phonons. Electron can Excited electrons can lower their energy emitting phonons. Electrons are always in some uh, condensed matter media. They are always um, oscillations of uh, the atoms in this media. That's why it is uh, rather universal mechanism. This is dissipation outside. It means that electrons do not exchange their energy, but rather 
it goes to some other degree of freedom, it goes to environment and this um, uh, fawn on would eventually leave the structure. Right, sir, so that's illustrated with this picture. I hope you can see it. So there's excited electron. Um, phonon is emitted. Uh, and this is uh, electron phonon interaction, which is responsible for this. And electron would get to lower energy. Right. Estimations show that uh, this uh, rate is proportional to the density, uh, the photon, uh, sorry, phonon density of states, which goes as a cube of energy at low energies. And uh, although this uh, dissipation mechanism is uh, pretty relevant even at low temperatures like 10k it becomes pretty much irrelevant below below sub uh, at sub kelvin temperatures right the reason for that that this uh, power is uh, huge so this rate becomes very small upon lowering temperature. Okay, so there is a relation estimation for this rate. Good. Uh, if you are below 1K, we can forget about whole nons and we can concentrate on another uh, mechanism, which is dissipation inside. Uh, it's electron electron scattering. I would like to get some uh, heuristic picture of this phenomena, so I don't want to talk about uh, the two particles which come together, interact, and collide. Uh, instead, I would uh, uh, say the following. Uh, electrons interact with each other with electric field. Electric field produced by one electron affects the other electrons. And instead of um, uh, looking at um, uh, electron electron uh, scattering, one can better think of an electron, which gives its energy to uh, electromagnetic environment. Yeah. So how we can characterize interaction with environment? that we also kind of study for tunneling in the previous lecture. The interaction with environment is characterized by some resistance. Okay. If you recognize that, we can immediately um, estimate the dissipation rate. Dissipation rate is the energy of this electron, right? That's the scale we have, uh, times some uh, coefficient which uh, characterizes the interaction with environment. And uh, right, this dimensions coefficient, just uh, this resistance in terms of um, GQ. GQ. Ah, the only question uh, which remains is what resistance is this? The resistance uh, should be a resistance of piece of metal at certain lengths.
which length is this? Uh, if for dissipation, since we are talking about energy changes of the order of temperature, this length is different like this. We have a frequency um, of the order of inverse temperature, uh, of the order of temperature that defines uh, the propagation scale at which it occurs. So this is resistance at this uh, length scale. But interestingly enough, there is uh, perhaps rather trivial but striking effect. This resistance depends on geometry uh, for these electrons, where these electrons are situated. It can be three-dimensional and then uh, uh, resistance scale like one over size. It can be two-dimensional and resistance does not change if we change uh, the lens. Or it can be one-dimensional and uh, like in a wire and resistance will be just proportional to the lens. Different situations that lead to different temperature dependencies of uh, of uh, dissipation or this mechanism that can be seen experimentally. Um, good question, and perhaps it's question to you. What defines geometry in this case? Of course, we don't have uh, ideal uh, one-dimensional, two-dimensional materials. Um, what is uh, the land scale which defines geometry in this case? Anybody there, to Answer? Uh, yeah, so the suggestion was that uh, is like for one dimensional L is uh, other dimensions. Uh, uh, that would be a little bit too optimistic. All right, let's us uh, draw what we're talking about. So we can see the, for instance, sample of this uh, size. Fine. So it is one dimensional in this definition. The lens is bigger than all other dimensions. However, we are talking about something which happens at energy scale LT. Uh, right, LT. Let me put the scale here as a cloud, right? So if this LT is smaller than the cross section of the sample, the sample is still three dimensional. Here, yeah. electrons do not feel uh, do not feel the edges. But if we lower the temperature, this scale becomes bigger, and it can exceed. So let me again uh, uh, draw the scale as a cloud. It can exceed cross section size. So in this case, the same sample becomes one dimensional. One dimensional with respect to this process. It's also handy, one does have to make uh, different samples. One could just change temperature within the same sample. And then by, uh, by uh, magic changes its effective dimensionality. Right, is it? Is it clear what I explained? 
The same for two dimensions, we can consider kind of uh, a fi Ooh. What did I do? Um, uh, we can consider a film like this of a certain thickness. And there are two situations if uh, LT is smaller than thickness. Electron C is three dimensional simple. Uh, at lower temperature, it becomes bigger than the, uh, than the thickness of the film, so it becomes two dimensional. All right. So that's kind of fine, important point in that. Uh, Kind of physics. If there are questions about this, I would be glad to talk more about. Dimensionality, dependence of uh, dissipation rate on the dimensionality. Um, good. You don't have questions, so uh, let me go on. Right, let me list mechanisms of the phasing. First of all, phonons, and eventually, uh, since uh, any dissipation, as we uh, discussed in the beginning of uh, the lecture, uh, um, Quenches uh, state, quenches quantum mechanical phase. Same phonons um, also serve as a uh, dephasing mechanism, but they are irrelevant below 1k. Uh, next mechanism it's uh, electron electron interactions. As for dissipation, they come about uh, fluctuations of uh, electric field, which can be characterized by resistance, which in fact amount to Nyquist law noise. We will discuss it uh, in a minute. Let me just uh, mention that it also depends on uh, geometry uh, by the same reason. Uh, because resistance depends on geometry. And uh, right, that's something which we could expect. Uh, but in fact, it appears that the most relevant mechanisms of dephasing and uh, sometimes also dissipation at uh, uh, very low temperatures are not related to interaction uh, with photons or other electrons, rather it appeared to be spin effects. Uh, we already know that spin is a sort of phase and for weak localization, spin uh, orbit scattering changes interference pattern uh, and can be seen as uh, competition of peak and dip in weak localization traces. Um, this is not relevant for dissipation and dephasing since it's elastic process. But there can be inelastic processes whereby electrons scatter at stray magnetic impurities. Nobody is perfect, no sample is perfect. And from time to time, in a copper sample, we encounter an atom of uh, ferrum, ferromagnetic atom. And there can be scattering which, uh, of spin, and that causes the phasing. Right, mechanisms of the phasing. Uh, let me talk about this is, uh, I find it very uh, instructive di uh, discussion. 
let me talk about the effect of Nyquist noise. Right? Let me first recall a formula. I don't know, I suppose you know this. Perhaps it was in the course about uh, electronics, about systems and signals. Uh, that's about voltage noise, which we can observe at a certain resistor. At uh, low frequencies, it's like noise proportional to temperature. It's called Nyquist noise, it's called uh, Johnson Nyquist noise. Let me uh, ask a question. Is there any, is there somebody who did not hear about this, about, uh, who doesn't know the formula for electric noise uh, for intrinsic electric noise, thermal noise. Okay. Uh, one does not know it. All right. Just confess. Who of you knows this? Joseph uh, uh, Johnson Nyquist noise. All right. Dennis um, heard, uh, has heard about this. Um, do you remember which course was that? Dennis. Yeah, signals and systems. That would be natural from the other hand in this course if I remember it correctly, you don't talk much about physics. It's more like as a mathematics, or yeah, transforms, whatever, filters or electronic engineering. I um, need to come in contact with teachers of this course to make sure that they, uh, it, it, it is very fundamental, each resistor produces electric noise if uh, physics students, students of physics don't know this that that's really not not uh, a good idea good sir <laughs> let me just say we take a resistor whatever resistor at certain temperature and at the ends of this resistor we have voltage fluctuations white noise spectrum proportional to temperature, proportional to the resistance. Uh, right, so now let us see how does it affect the phase of an electron. Electron feels the potential, it shifts its energy, so there is phase accumulation over, over time. Good, then we apply the same formula, which I showed to you, which I've derived for you. Uh, it's about the uh, variation of the phase accumulated during time interval. It is proportional to time interval, right? From that, we get immediately uh, decoherence rate. Decoherence rate is proportional to temperature. And there's a small coefficient coming with that. It is small provided the resistance, uh, the resistance which produces uh, this Johnson Nyquist noise is smaller uh, than um, resistance quantum G U minus one. We remember this is something like 10 to the four 
home. Uh, fine. Uh, right. So the only point we need to know what for resistance it is. And again, we could use uh, the same reasoning as we did. It depends on dimensions. It's a resistance at, uh, at uh, eventually coherence lines. Look, it's different resistance uh, than that de defined as a temperature. Actually, it uh, happens at larger uh, scale. And if this resistance really depends on the lens, the formula does not define the coherence lens. Rather, it is still an equation to determine the decoherence lens, decoherence time rate. Precisely like we see for colored in line. Okay, let's look at different cases. And it turns out that for uh, one dimensions, we have a resistance which is proportional to the lens. Here's the lens. This is an equation for tau phi. We solve this equation. We got a uh, rate which goes uh, down with a power which is smaller than t. So there is uh, eventually a subomic situation. But now for electrons. For 2D, again, uh, the resistance does not depend on the lens. So the situation uh, remains like this. It is, uh, it is constant. For 3D, uh, if you really use these formulas, we would uh, get sense this expression, which goes uh, like one over T minus two. That's because um, at smaller scales, um, uh, the resistance goes like one over L uh, in 3 D, uh, so formally it goes to zero, but it, that cannot happen, right? So there'll be always uh, some small um, a piece of uh, metal with finite resistance. If one takes this into account, then uh, there will be um, superomic dependence of uh, uh, the coherence rate on temperature. Uh, let us see how much time do I have. I don't have much time, but let me just uh, shortly, since uh, anyway, um, it's more for empty time, but let me talk about experiments on the phasing and on <coughs> on uh, Decoherence. First of all, um, let me talk about sorry the phase and dissipation. We first talk about the phase. Right, so it was a rather simple experiment. They measure the resistance of silver wire, and uh, that uh, actually wiggles quite a bit. But this wiggling is not important. Uh, what is important is that the wire is pretty, is, well, is thin, but pretty uh, long. This means it's one dimensional situation. Uh, and also the wire is so long that it's not uh, really uh, coherent, All right? So the um, the phasing lens is quite sizable; it's like forty microns, but the total lens of the wire is like one. Okay, they make it that long to get well-defined magnetic resistance traces and to characterize neatly decoherence, which will depend on. Um, uh, 
uh, will, will depend on uh, temperature, will depend on some other parameters. This parameter gives uh, a difference between these two figures, but I don't tell you uh, yet what parameter it is. Right. So, how to uh, measure it? Uh, there are curves at different temperatures. Apparently, they have different width of this peak. And they just extract the peak width, uh, and that gives a uh, pi. And uh, ultimately, to pi. Right. What were the results? Good, this uh, two phi versus temperature. At uh, temperatures bigger than 1K, one sees uh, tau phi goes down very fast with increasing temperature, and this is due to four knots. But in a wide interval of temperatures, uh, the defined design follows the law, which we can, we have just derived the law, which comes from Nyquist laws. Uh, very good. So this uh, tau phi becomes uh, long and longer with uh, decreasing temperature. Good, but let's uh, make more detailed measurement. Let's really concentrate on these low temperatures. That's what they see. They have seen saturation of decoherence at low temperature. But it cannot be so. That was uh, quite some discussion about this experiment and early experiments which show the same uh, uh, same uh, situation. Uh, no dephasing can happen at zero temperature. Let me shortly explain why it's so. Um, the argument is quite um, simple. At zero temperature, the system must be in a ground state. And this is such a quantum mechanical state. Quantum mechanics has to be preserved in the ground state. And zero temperature dephasing means eventually that quantum mechanics is strong. So our experimental observation of this effect um, was very strange to put it slightly. And this particular experiment finally pinpoints the reason for this saturation. Okay, you see the curves for different samples and the saturation changes from sample to sample. And it appears to be that these uh, samples differ only in a number of magnetic impurities. Number of magnetic impurities is astonishing. It's one per million, one per hundred thousand atoms. <coughs> uh, you get to be very good chemists to ever, ever uh, detect these impurities in a sample. However, they appear to determine um, the the uh, uh, the phase at zero temperature. Good. Um, I'm alone over the time. Let me just mention relaxation. Uh, basically, the same group about the same time also measured uh, energy distribution in one dimensional wire between two reservoirs. The way to measure uh, is to uh, use a sharp column blockade feature, um, uh, which we discussed at lecture 11. 
remember the conductance uh, which uh, became very small at low voltages. Uh, this sharp picture is pinned at Fermi level and uh, right if there are two Fermi levels as we expect <coughs> in case of uh, no relaxation this uh, Coulomb blockade feature would uh, be displayed like this which they observe right so in this way they can characterize uh, dissipation in the sun right it also depends on the uh, picture funny side of the story that dissipation uh, also appeared to be uh, dominated by scattering at this magnetic impurities so there is uh, um, and straightforward difference between samples with um, uh, silver of five nines or six nines, which means that here we have one um, a magnetic atom per million of silver atoms, here per uh, thousand, uh, hundred thousand. And there is, uh, despite of the, this small number of impurities, a uh, eventually dominate the electron dissipation at this uh, scale. All right, I'm done. I'm done with this lecture. I'm done with this course. I hope you enjoy it as generation students before you. And I also hope that future generations will enjoy for quite some time. Quantum transport still remains, uh, remains uh, an active research area. Sir, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. We still uh, meet several times also before the examination. So, I finish the lecture. See you around.